Welcome everyone to the first episode of The Shift. This is a new live stream series from the Story of Stuff Project. I'm Brett Chamberlain, Director of Community Engagement, and today I'll be chatting with environmental journalist Jim Robbins. We'll be talking about what goes wrong when we start treating nature as a resource to be exploited, rather than as a complex system whose health is inextricably linked with our own. But before we kick off that conversation, I just want to say a few more words about this new live video series that we're calling The Shift. Now, I know it's already becoming a bit of a trope, but I don't really know how else to say it. These last few weeks have turned life upside down. The global coronavirus pandemic is raising some really big questions and some really hard questions about our economy, our politics, and our society at every scale. We're being confronted with questions about how well we share resources, how we've been treating our environmental support systems, and how resilient communities around the globe are. Will the way that we respond to the peril and the possibility of this moment reveal something about society's capacity to envision and to manage big change? The shift is going to dig into these questions through conversations with the thinkers and the doers that are shaping how we're seeing and reacting to the coronavirus pandemic and what comes after. So with that, let me introduce our first guest. Jim, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Jim Robbins has written about science and environmental issues for the New York Times for more than 35 years. And he's also the author of six books. His first book is about Yellowstone National Park and it's titled Last Refuge, Environmental Showdown in the American West. And his most recent book is titled The Wonder of Birds, what they tell us about ourselves, the world, and a better future. So Jim, thanks again for being here. Now, before we dive in, I wonder if you could just tell us a bit more about yourself and your background. How did you get started doing this type of storytelling work and why are these types of conversations so important? Well, in some ways I started without really knowing where all this, all my books were leading and my, my reporting, but what they've all kind of ended up being is about systems. And the very first book I wrote about Yellowstone was about how we drew a box to create Yellowstone Park back in 1872, but we didn't understand ecosystems then. So the question the book raised was how do you manage a national park when you don't have all of the system to manage? So since that time I've been writing about, about systems and the importance of understanding them. Um, I started writing for the New York Times in 1980 and a lot of what I've covered has been about our poor uh, uh, understanding of systems, natural systems, and how to kind of educate people to um, to uh, better manage these these systems. And a lot of people understand this. It's just we've got a poor. Uh, a lot of scientists understand this. We've got poor uh, communication between the people who do the research and the policymakers. And so a lot of what I tried to do is is bring these things out so that policymakers and others are educated about how important these systems are. Well, that's right. We at the Story of Stuff Project often say facts on tap, not on top. And I think that your work illustrates the importance of taking scientific research and converting it into narratives that people can understand and create policy around. Now, the piece of yours that actually first crossed my desk was a 2012 piece in the New York Times titled The Ecology of Disease. And in that piece, you wrote that most infectious diseases don't just happen. They're the results of things that people do to nature. Can you explain? Yes, so you have a wild area, um, say in this case in China, and someone goes in and there are viruses circulating in wild areas amongst bats or snakes or pangolins. They're not sure where the coronavirus came from that's now causes global pandemic. Uh, they do know it came from China. Um, so these viruses circulate, have been circulating for thousands of years in these populations. And just like we get cold viruses and, and nothing uh, bad happens to us, we get sniffles and, and uh, coughing and so on, but we survive. Um, these animals also get these, these uh, viruses and, and they've adapted to them. Their immune system is used to these viruses and so they might break a little bit of a sweat, but they keep going. Um, and then um, um, humans come in and we have night, what are called naive immune systems. And that means that we don't know anything. Our immune system knows nothing about these viruses. And when we get it, it's a much more virulent reaction. And so in this case, in China, they think someone 
captured a, a bat uh, or a snake or a pangolin, brought it out and, you, and sold it and ate it for food. And the virus that was contained within that pangolin uh, ecosystem or whatever it was, then jumped the species barrier and into humans. Either it was ingested or it was, uh, you know, through a cut on someone's hand who butchered the animal. And then, boom, that virus, this coronavirus is so virulent that it took off and no one can stop it. It spread like wildfire around the world. And, and the experts in, in these areas have been warning about this thing for a long time and, and that these systems are at risk of being broken open and causing this kind of pandemic. But, but not many people have paid attention to it, certainly not the policymakers. Just last year, uh, there was a piece in the New York Times, um, they cut, the Trump administration cut all the funding for something called PREDICT, which was a small scale program compared to the, the kind of program we need, but it was a way of forecasting pandemics. And, and that program kind of went away, uh, even though it had support under Obama and, and President Bush. But uh, so it, 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 policymakers just don't get it when it comes to this kind of science sometimes. Now, I'm sure that the crossover of infectious diseases from animal populations into human populations is surely nothing new, but you reported in your piece that these types of diseases quadrupled in the 21st century. Why are we seeing so much more of these types of diseases than we did before? Well, there's more people on the planet. There's six billion more people on the planet than there were a century ago. And they're pushing into areas that have never been pushed into before and they need a place to go they need a place to farm they need a place to raise pigs whatever it is they're doing in that in that virgin territory so they're clearing a lot of new areas and they're creating an interface between humans and these wild areas and these viruses that live in wild animals um, it's, and partly the third part of this this troika here is is our travel our international travel in <clears throat> in this century has boomed um, China has many more members of the middle class than it did 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, cheap airline fares have enabled people to travel to places they never traveled before. Uh, India has more members of the middle class. And then people in the U.S., 10,000 people a day retire in the U.S. and they want to travel. So if you look at, I've written about uh, what travel is doing to the world, but if you look at airline um, trips, it's just going uh, through the roof. And so people are traveling faster and to more places than they ever did. And so that's a big part of why these viruses are spreading so rapidly and there's more of them spreading. You also provided a couple of examples in that article of the ways that we're modifying our natural systems uh, and our environment around us and the impact on not just the rate of exposure to new diseases, but the rate of spread of those new diseases. Could you tell us a little bit, bit, bit about African robins? About, I'm sorry, about what? The African robins uh, as an example of um, modifying our natural ecosystems and making ourselves a, a, at a greater risk of infectious diseases like West Nile. It was American robin. And uh, it was, sorry. right, and those are those robins with the red breasts that we see in our yards. And we've created ecosystems like our front yards, which, um, uh, our, our healthy uh, habitat for American robins. Um, not a lot of birds can thrive in a city, some can, and, but robins in particular do well because of the, of the habitat. And, and they also happen to be a super spreader. They are susceptible to West Nile virus, they get it. So you have this kind of double-edged sword where you've created ideal habitat for um, American robins and they happen to be a super spreader. So they flock all over, all over the country carrying West Nile virus with them. Uh, and um, it's you know, affected hu humans, it's affected horses. It's, it can be a deadly disease, although it's not nearly as virulent as, as this coronavirus that's now spreading around the globe. Sure, so it sounds like it's not just our encroachment into nature, but what we're replacing it with that is creating uh, new vulnerabilities for these types of diseases. That's part of it. And then part of it in the case of the coronavirus is the, is the, are the hallmarks of this particular member. There's 5,000 coronaviruses, uh, and this is one, one species or subspecies, I'm not sure which, but um, you know, the hallmarks of it are that no one knows they have it 
until it's it's um, already too late. They've spread it around, and that's that's key to the spread of this. Is that this particular coronavirus is out there circulating before we we have a chance to to do anything about it, to quarantine people or whatever. Now, in addition to human populations being at risk, you wrote recently about agricultural systems being vulnerable of not just infectious diseases, but fungus and other pests, both as a reflection of our modification of ecosystems we've just been describing, but also of trends like the climate crisis. Could you talk a little bit more about that? About the climate crisis and uh, the spread of disease? Sure. Well, in this case, I was just reading something about this a little while ago. Um, you have... Uh, people who have respiratory problems, severe ones in places like China and India from uh, um, pollution, but also because it's warmer and um, creates a better atmosphere for the, um, uh, for the um, virus to, to circulate uh, in, their, in their body and it weakens their immune system. Uh, and so people are becoming more susceptible to these things, at least that's, that's the hypothesis because of the fact that there are these other factors working on our, our well-being. Uh, as far as climate change uh, in, uh, and some of the things that are happening, I've read also about Antarctica and how because there's more places uh, melting uh, and more areas are accessible, there's more people going into those places. And so they're catching or bringing diseases with them um, that never would have been uh, able to thrive there before because it was so cold. So, and then of course there wouldn't have been people there before. One of the concerns is that people will bring these diseases to a place like the Galapagos on a plane, a, a mosquito on a plane that brings tourists could bring diseases. So. Uh, climate change is also changing the nature of um, the nature of of the human footprint and um, and disease profiles. So it sounds like our encroachment into new ecosystems is increasing the rate of infectious diseases jumping over into human populations, the rate at which they can spread within our populations, and ultimately the consequences of people getting sick and ill for some of the reasons that you've just just highlighted. But Beyond reducing the risk of these negative ecosystems, there's also positive benefits. I'm sorry, beyond the risk of reducing these negative outcomes, there are positive benefits of maintaining healthy ecosystems. Now you have a TEDx talk about trees, which I think was also the topic of one of your books. And you talk a little bit about the willow tree and what we can learn and, and gain from that tree. Could you share some more? Well, a lot of some of that speculation, but here's the kind of the bottom line of my reporting for the last 40 years is that we really don't understand the world we live in very well. It's, it's really for a lot of different reasons, but, but we really have done a, a poor job of, of understanding our home. And I think that's at the bottom of a lot of this kind of a thing. And of course, this, this ecosystem, the ecology of disease is part of that. But when it comes to trees, well, you think, gosh, it's, a, it's a, a stick with leaves. We must know everything about trees and forests. And as I kind of dove into that world of trees and forests, I realized we really don't know much about a tree. I talked to a redwood scientist in California and was asking him questions about redwoods. And he stopped me and he said, you know, it's embarrassing how little we know about trees. And, and you take something like the rhizosphere, for example. And the rhizosphere is the root system. It's hard to study. It's underground. It's immensely complicated. Um, yet, around the root system of a tree is a tiny veneer of microbes that live around the roots that clean all of our water in this world. And we we barely understand this mechanism, but you know it's responsible for cleaning the world's water because the, as the rain falls, it's taken up by the roots. And in order for the the tree to um, to have clean water, these microbes clean it, and then the tree exudes a, an exudent that feeds these microbes. So it's a symbiotic relationship, yet, yet it's barely understood. And you talked about willow trees. One of the areas of trees that we really don't know a lot about is something called aerosols. And there are some people who believe that willow trees, because of the chemical um, salicylic acid, I believe is the, is the full name, uh, is, is the basis is where aspirin came from, uh, willow bark. And some people believe that 
willows which surround waterways all over the world take up the water and clean it and, and disinfect it through this process of taking it up and then releasing it into the atmosphere. I don't know if that's true, but it's the kind of, of informed speculation I like to traffic in because we don't understand aerosols very well at all. And it may be also that some trees that aerosolize uh, with anti-cancer compounds, chemopreventatives, which, those things which prevent cancer, those things are, are coming out of trees all the time, limonene, terpene, and so on, these, these agents. And we're breathing them in. You know, does that prevent cancer? I don't know. Um, but I think it's worth looking at, and it would make sense if it did. So I think, I think those are the kind of questions I try to get into with the tree and the bird book is, is we need to start asking different questions about this world that we live in and, and, and be smarter about how we, we live in it. I think there's a lot of that's known that isn't, isn't made into policy. A lot of research isn't, isn't uh, taken up by policymakers and made into policy. But a lot of research falls short because some things don't get funded or it's not considered um, uh, important enough or whatever. And I, I think that's wrong. And I think one of the ways to kind of figure out what we should be doing is to go to other cultures. There's thousands of indigenous cultures that have ideas about how to live in the world and have adapted to the world in, in places for thousands of years. And they must be doing something right. And let's, let's, uh, let's ask them what they have to say about living in this world in a way that doesn't destroy it. What are some of the questions that you think researchers should be asking and that we as a culture more broadly might be asking of indigenous communities, for example, and of nature itself, frankly? What does a bird mean to you? What does a bird mean to you? Is it, is it an ancestor? Uh, one of the uh, anthropologists I interviewed in my book, and this I, I call my book uh, informally an interpretation of birds. If you look at birds and you're creative, you can interpret things about the world uh, that that birds can tell us. And I interviewed a um, an anthropologist who studied different different peoples and. She talks that they routinely have this ability to move their consciousness, their mind, outside their body and to sense the world around them, whether it's trees or birds or whatever, in a very intimate way, other people, and uh, experience some of the emotion of the world in that way. And, uh, well, jeepers, if, if my um, uh, nervous system is capable of these things, it's an important question. Do we have a different kind of more intimate relationship with the planet uh, than we think we do or can we? And I think that's really important. And I think that would change the way we are in the world if we were uh, more closely um, connected to it. And so those are the kind of questions I think we should be asking. That's one. And then the obvious questions are things like medicines and um, uh, food supplies and so on, or food crops and so on that are, can survive hotter temperatures, that kind of a thing. Um, there's just a whole raft of, of more imaginative questions that, that we could do and, and I think are more important. Yeah, so it sounds as if we're really learning, unfortunately, by doing from the consequences of our, our modern, modern world and our extractive economy, some of the consequences of taking advantage of nature in the way that we do and yet we still have far more to learn about the positive benefits of being part of a natural ecosystem. Right, and at the same time, we're we're learning about this. We're destroying it. I mean, we're we're we've repealed parts of the Endangered Species Act. We're we're doing damage in in, in ways we don't even understand um, or we don't know that we're doing. And um, Aldo Leopold said, "The first rule of intelligent tinkering is to save all the pieces." And so before we, we, we understand the world well at all, we're, we're damaging it faster all the time because of the number of people and because of climate change and those things. So I would say we need kind of a crash course in understanding the place that we live. Yeah, absolutely. I want to pull up one more example from your, your recent book on birds, just to highlight what we stand to learn from observing natural systems better and even incorporating some of those learnings into our design through processes like biomimicry. We spoke earlier of chemicals in, aspirin, in willow bark that can be used to create aspirin. Um, but as I say, I think that there's benefits to be gained from nature that aren't just extracting, you know, that aren't taking chemicals uh, and, and reproducing them in a material sense 
but more intangible, ineffable benefits that we can learn from studying nature and observing how systems work and then bringing those practices into our own culture and into our own economy. Uh, I think one example that you provide in your book is about buzzard wings as an inspiration for glider design. I wonder if you have any other examples of the less uh, material things that we can still gain to fr from or learn from from nature. Well, there's a lot of things we can learn from nature. Um, I, I interviewed Jessica Meir, who's a, um, a an astronaut now, and she was made made headlines here a few months ago as as a astronaut on the uh, space station, um, and she studied birds, uh, both the um, bar-tailed goose, which flies over the Himalaya mountains at 29,000 or so feet. It's adapted to this incredibly oxygen poor environment. It does it every year, it migrates. And uh, she wanted to understand how these birds could adapt to such an extreme environment. The other bird she studied is the uh, emperor penguin, which dives down to 1500 feet. Um, and does quite well. Humans can dive down to about, um, I think, 135 or 140 feet without causing problems, uh, you know, with the bends, nitrogen bubbles, and so on. Um, but these birds can go down 1,500 feet. How do they do it? And um, she fits them out with transmitters and so on, and, and lets them go into the ice. And one of the things that that they can do is um, lower their heart rate. They, when they get ready to dive, it goes up to about 250 beats per minute. When they're diving for five or six minutes underneath the water, it goes down to five or six beats per minute. Now, I know from the books I've written on the human nervous system that humans can do this. We just have never learned how to do it. Uh, I don't know if they can do it in such an extreme way, but I, I know that we can bring our heart rate under control if we're, if we're taught how to do it. There's a lot of things out there like that that we can learn from nature that, that tell us something about ourselves. And she's also looking at a possible medication from these birds. Uh, when these birds um, come back to the surface, they, they release the uh, blood again and they clamp off their blood flow to their organs and then they come to the surface and they release that blood again. And it doesn't cause antioxidant damage, which it does when humans have their their uh, organs clamped off uh, during surgery, it can cause damage when blood flow is restored. But these birds can do it on their own without causing damage. So how do they do it? Is it could it lead to a medication that we can take to prevent antioxidant damage after surgery or something like that? So, I mean, I, I could make a long list of all the things that, that bird researchers could be asked and indigenous people could be asked because they've learned, again, over thousands of years and they've adapted to these places. And, and there's a whole, uh, I think 7,000 or so indigenous cultures around the world. So there's a universe of things that we could learn from them. Mm -hmm. Over your decades of working as an environmental reporter, what are some of your biggest learnings? The thing that have stuck with you the most, the things that you share with others, the things that have made the biggest difference in your own life? Uh, hmm. And there's lots. Um, everything we do should be predicated on keeping nature intact. Otherwise, if you're if you're destroying nature to make money or to provide even things that are important, in the end you're you're going to have a bigger bill to pay than if you kept nature healthy and functioning and robust. Um, and then this this uh, this uh, pandemic is a good a good uh, example to look at because. You know, it's we passed a two trillion dollar bill a few days ago because this pandemic caused all these job, this economic problem and job layoffs. Um, that's just a drop in the bucket compared to what's coming. Yet, if we had spent uh, billions, several billions, to to put in a program to understand where these pandemics could surface next and prevent them and teach people about this, and then it would have saved all of these trillions of dollars. And it's a perfect lesson for learning that sometimes things we, we do in a short-sighted way will cost us a lot more down the road. And it's especially true when we break open these systems and destroy them because these systems are what, um, are what keep us alive. They cradle us. They cradle our societies. And we've learned and we're learning the hard way that nature intact has protective effects against disease and that's what i'm saying about about these ecosystems there are people out there now who are 
campaigning to set aside half the earth, to protect half the earth because biodiversity is being lost, because um, uh, people are pushing into areas they never pushed into before, and because we need these systems and we need these, these other organisms out there that sustain us. And um, they're getting a lot of traction these days because people realize we're, we're at the 11th plus hour of these, these, um, of these urgencies, of these emergencies. And um, people realize, are realizing, and I hope it's not too late, that, that nature is, these systems are what keep us going, whether it's oxygen from the oceans or whether it's food sto sources from, uh, from nature. We, we, we need these things to, to keep, us, uh, keep us alive and healthy. Absolutely. What are some core solutions that you think that you'd like to see policymakers adopting and act activists and advocates pushing for? I think we have a poor eco literacy in this country. Um, we need, you know, e ecosystems 101 at a, at a young age. I mean, we talk about recycling, we talk about, um, uh, you know, smoking and these things, but we need something that, that impresses on us the life-sustaining nature of, of these ecosystems. Um, whether it, well, for example, I did a piece for the Times on a series of dams um, that are built on the Columbia River and have destroyed the salmon run there. And people have spent $16 billion trying to restore the salmon run that these dams destroyed. And now whales are starving at the, in the Pacific Ocean because there's so few salmon. And so we need to tell people, and, and whales are perfect because they're charismatic, and people love killer whales. And so you, you can teach people not only about killer whales and how there's not enough salmon for them to eat, but how the system of the salmon spawning every year up into the mountains of Idaho and then returning are part of a, a bigger picture. And I think we're missing the big picture and I think that could be emphasized in our culture. And I think a better, a better connection between researchers and um, especially more imaginative researchers and, um, and policymakers. We need to understand the importance of of, uh, of these systems and how they're going to cost us a lot more in the long run if we don't pay attention to them. Well, Jim, thank you so much for sharing all your learnings and most importantly that call to action. We hope that members of our community that are tuning in and the world at large will take this moment as an opportunity to reflect on the need to approach natural systems with humility, to recognize how little we know about nature and yet how important, how much we not just depend on it, but, but of course, a part of it. I'm reminded of the Rachel Carson quote that man is a part of nature and his war on nature is ultimately a war against himself. Pardon, of course, the gendered language there. Um, Jim, before we sign off, um, how could folks connect with you? Would you like to bump the title of your book? Do you have any a Twitter feed that you, people can connect with you on? Yeah, it's at Jim Robbins 19. That's my Twitter handle. You can find me on the internet pretty easily. Um, and I like the word humility. I think that that is key to this. We have assumed too many things about this planet and that the things we do to it are okay. And I think we need to back off. We need to reduce our footprint and, and adopt a more humility, more respect, perhaps, for, for this place that we live. Because I think everyone realizes now, or most people do, that we've, we've crossed a threshold, whether it's climate change or biodiversity crisis or or this problem with the pandemic. We're, we're, we've got some problems to deal with. Well, an important call to arms. Uh, hopefully we've got another generation of change makers that are learning from this moment and are ready to, to bring us into a more just and sustainable future. So with that, Jim, thank you again so much for your time, for sharing all your knowledge and wisdom. And thank you, the viewers, for tuning into this first episode of The Shift. Stay tuned for more conversations to come.